Bobby Rinko, I want to welcome you to Evening Upstairs at your library. Tonight's program will take a look at producer landmarks from days gone by. Our speaker is the author of several books, including Antiques and Advertising and Education and the popular Coca-Cola Value Guide. He has served two years vice president and eight years as the president of the Market House Museum. While in his leadership, many changes have been made and the museum has grown. He's a member of the Coca-Cola Club of America and Federation of Historic Bottle Collectors. He is a Duke of Paducah and a Kentucky Colonel, and he works diligently saving our community's historic treasures and promoting Paducah's rich history. Let's welcome our presenter, B.J. Summers, as he leads us on a fascinating journey through Paducah's past. Thank you. Man, it sounds like y'all got somebody talking to you tonight, <laughs> other than a retired telephone man. How y'all doing this evening? All right. How many of you are originally from Paducah? Who got a room full? That's scary. How many of you remember the twenties? All right. I might have a chance at this then. There's some stuff up here on the table that has some relevance to what we're going to be showing you tonight. Some of it doesn't. I just thought it was interesting. You might want to take a look at it. Um, there's a Yank. There's actually two Yank uh, magazines laying over the, on the end of the table. After this is over with, if you'd like to look at them, because they were made in December of 1944. And somebody in there found out that the people were from Paducah, Kentucky, were actually in the war. So you got an article down uh, in there on that. Uh, if you would, however, just be real careful, because that paper is very fragile. Um, and anything else that y'all want to ask me about when this is over with, I don't trust that guy right there. <laughs> Anything else that you all want to ask me about when this is over with, feel free. Now, here is one problem. I've got all this stuff up here. I've got an hour that I've got to get through this. And if I don't, there's a guy standing back there jumping up and down and waving things. <laughs> so I'll get through it. But then I've also got just an hour or slightly under to get all this stuff packed back up, and it took me about an hour and a half to get it all set out. So if you come up here and I'm packing stuff and you want to ask me a question, feel free, ask me. I may look like I'm not paying attention to you. I might not be, <laughs> because that hearing aid has just gone out. So <laughs> holler in my face, I'll get, you. I'll, I'll, I'll get it. So we'll do our best with it anyhow. Uh, the Paducah presentation that I've got tonight, to some of you who are, uh, I'll have to say my, my, my regulars uh, that are here quite a bit, you're going to recognize some of it. Some of it, you know what, um, I realized whenever Bobby asked me to do this and uh, there's been some health issues in our family, so I, I really, my time frame was uh, kind of short, not that, Bobby asked me about a year ago, and I just waited till the last minute. But anyhow, uh, I couldn't remember what I'd, I had pulled out and brought in here before. So if you haven't seen it, there it is. And if you haven't been to one of these presentations, it'll all be new to you. <laughs> Up on the screen, you see the one of the postcards that was probably produced by the millions. I know I've seen stacks and stacks and stacks of these things. Um, when Wilson was in business, uh, I believe their upstairs was absolutely loaded with those things. And um, of course, Paducah wanted to be the one to announce that they were now going forward, that they were a fresh new city. And people used to just absolutely love to talk about Paducah. And right here you see one of the the things that almost all collectors 
like to get their hands on. This was a license plate attachment. This is probably as rare, if not rarer, than this because this thing right here is just almost not to be found. And believe it or not, I've got, I've got a friend who walked up to me two weeks ago and said, here, you want that license plate? I said, absolutely, because I've got the topper that goes with it. Uh, I got another friend. Uh, so Paducah wanted to tell everybody that they weren't just a small a uh, southern sleepy river town that they were into the modern age they were into the as my one of my buddies used to call it they were into the bum age they were out there at the bum plant making making all those bums uh of course no short uh i mean we can't talk about that without saying a big thank you to uh alvin barkley he might not have been the guy you voted for but he was certainly the guy who would push money in the, to Paducah if he could. And that plant has, when they were building it, even now as they're getting ready, to, or they say they're getting ready to, to uh, shut it down, it's still making a ton of money for this area. So uh, Vice President Barkley was, was certainly good to Paducah on that, along with the people that came in to build that plant. You had restaurants that had to open up. You had dry goods stores, people buying clothes, uh, more groceries to be bought. You had to have a, um, a place to stay. Rental was almost non-existent during Paducah at this time. And of course, we call it a little tourist camp. Uh, they were set up in anybody's backyard that could manage to get one there. So there was just a lot brought about as a result of that. Let's look back at some of the things that were before this. And all of you that was here during my last <laughs> talk, remember that uh, I had a little trouble with this mouse and they, they got me a new mouse this time. I just have to push a button if I can figure out which one to push. Right here is, is a typical example of a small, lazy river town, and what you might think of one. That was the old courthouse. It was put up before the Civil War, built in 1858. And uh, my mother still talks about how pretty, uh, she wasn't born in 1858, by the way, she came along later, but she, she always talked about how pretty the, the uh, flowers were there, and although you, it's hard to see it right there, there was a goldfish pond there, and she said, you know, the kids would always go over there and harass the goldfish whenever they got a chance. So, uh, in that particular um, courthouse, stood until 1939. And that was kind of a bad play time to uh, start a, a new courthouse, but that's what happened. And uh, it didn't, the new one didn't get completed until, of course, after the war was over with. Oh man, I got, got it right, Jay. Right here is what I think was one of the prettiest old buildings in Paducah. This was, not the first city hall, but probably the, the second. And it was built with a basement under it. Walls were 22 inches thick. And all the ceilings in that building were either 14 feet high or 16 feet high. Of course, you understand that at the time they built that, air conditioning was just whatever was blowing through the window. So they tried to keep it just as cool as possible. And like a lot of other people, when they go to build something, they don't sit down and, and figure out, well, let's see, I will take up this much of the house and my wife is gonna take up this much of the house. So when they got that part of the city hall built and they started moving in, they didn't have enough room. 
the sheriff and the janitor shared the janitor's closet together. <laughs> now that, th that building was built in 1888, I'm sorry, 1882, and they managed to survive until 1909 whenever the city council finally decided they'd had enough of all of that fussing and griping and everybody falling all over each other in there. So they got the same architect to come back in. He, and this, is, this amazes me, he jacked up the roof on this place and they put tile, uh, railroad ties in there to hold it in place, got it up above where they needed it, and then they built the third floor on it. And that's, that's just amazing because today they probably tear the roof off of it and start over with something else. Although there is one guy out here on the I-24 loop. I kept coming by his building and he's a, he rents heavy equipment. He went over there and he decided he needed more room. He run four of those large cranes right up against that thing, hooked him up to it, and then he had welders go up and cut the beams on it and they just picked the roof up there and they put another floor on his building. So um, that's going pretty good. Um, the, you can see there was a, the bell, I'll try this, I don't know. The bell was right in there and then you had the clock up there. The bell is over in City Hall if you walk in the um, city hall from Fifth Street, you'll see it right between the doors. Now, the bell is another thing. Years and years ago, uh, it was sitting over at Noble Park behind one of those uh, recreation buildings. Um, and one night after Karate was over with, being somewhat of a collector, you have to be a snoop. So I walked around back to see what was back there, and it was a clock off of the city hall. They tore the building down. Nobody seemed to tell me where the clock went to. Of course, I probably figure it's just none of my business. <laughs> so, you know, that's, uh, that's one of them deals I wish we could come back up with. Now, city hall, a little few years later, Matter of fact, back about 64, 65, and on the uh, north, west, I'm sorry, on the south side over here, you see everything looks great on it, and really like it. What is that? A Plymouth? 64. There you go. Sitting out there in front, and there was originally a gas station and a taxi service sitting on that corner right there. Just as soon as they dedicated the new city hall, which was in February, uh, they brought in the wrecking machine and started tearing the thing down. Uh, instead of repurposing it or going green, as we like to say now, they uh, tore it down and now it's a beautiful black top parking lot. Um, Oh, oh, City Hall? Yeah. It, it was sitting at 4th uh, and Kentucky. Yeah. Oh, behind the top. Uh, uh, well, no, back down, back down a little bit further. Oh, okay. And to take the place of that beautiful old building, we had a we had an architect who designed a, a flat roofed building for Kentucky, which um, he was a uh, well known architect, and probably where he built all of his other stuff, it worked fine. But they started having trouble with that building almost as soon as the doors were opened on it. Uh, the basement would flood, and that's where the police department 
was, that's where jail was, that's where 911 was. Uh, they had a lot of problems with it. And eventually the police moved out, the jail moved out, 911's out. And about the only thing that I know of us down there now is they, they got a meeting rooms down there where occasionally you go to ha have a meeting with the mayor. And But other than that, I think most everything's gone. But they had a nice drive through whenever it was there. <laughs> and then, of course, in the center here, uh, in the atrium, um, is where they have a lot of uh, art shows and uh, that type of thing. Very nice looking building, just not, well, just not in my opinion, just real practical for Paducah. This was uh, one of the big deals about this building was that Paducah needed a new city hall. And at the time they were talking about a new city hall, Winston Golson was running for mayor. And so was Tom Wilson. Now, I don't want to get in anybody's political spot here, you know. But Tom Wilson was pushing for new, new, new. He wanted to be progressive. He wanted Paducah to join the catch up with the generation that we were in. Winston Golson wanted to move City Hall out to the Caterjohn building, which was available at that time with a whole bunch of rooms and a fairly solid building, and it's still standing out there and still beautiful. So uh, that was one of the problems, and during the mayoral campaign, that was pretty much what kicked Winston Golson back uh, to not being a politician anymore. So Tom Wilson won that fight. The old Riverside Hospital, and I know that, that I'm going to have to say it again, but those of you who have been here and seen this slideshow before have always... have seen me mess with this mouse more than once. That's supposed to be the red button. When this comes back up, if you look right, can I push that red button this time? Thank you. I still don't trust that guy. <laughs> look right there. There's two telephone men sitting on what is called a splicer's board, splicing lead cable out in front of that place. Now, there's a few telephone men. Well, no, there's maybe one full telephone man in the room. But how they got up there and how they kept that board from tipping is anybody's guess because you had to tie that thing off the ladder on both sides. So I don't know how on earth they managed to get that thing stay still but anyhow that, that's that's just a side note that the riverside hospital was built on the site of the old marine hospital and on the site of fort anderson and a scary thought but one that was is there is that the city of paducah administered the uh, hospital by a board of volunteers from the time it was built until the uh, sisters of, uh, uh, wait a minute, let me get this straight, until the uh, Catholic Church and the Diocese of Owensboro bought the hospital and took over. Later, they sold it to the uh, Sisters of St. Francis to administer, and they sold it to them for five, $500,000. Um, you can see in this corner down here where they had somewhat updated it. Of course, that other one was an old slide. But anyhow, they, they made it a more modern hospital. But they realized that they still had some to go. 
So the bishop had given the St. Mary School a plot of land off of Lone Oak Road and close to where 24 was to put up a new school. And he also gave the sisters some land to put the hospital. Now, that's a fairly early uh, postcard right there because there's been a lot added onto it since then. And on the right hand side, there's a ton of stuff added onto it. Y'all, do any of you remember that shot of the Western Baptist? Yes, that is that is an that is an old one. That's that's a that's a yes, yeah, sure is. And you can tell by the the little parking place they got there that they don't have nearly the the volume that they do now. No, no, that's I C. That the I C was taking care of people who weren't at the uh, Riverside or the Lourdes Hospital, and then they ceased to be a hospital. That was built in 1945. The Western, I mean the uh, Western Kentucky Baptist Association, decided to form a committee to check in to putting another hospital in Paducah and that was in 1945 the uh, the doors were finally opened on this in October of 1955 so there was about 10 years there between the time they started in 45 and the time they opened the doors in 55 and at the time they were proud of the fact that they had 117 adult beds and had 22 cribs in there. And of course, you can't recognize any part of uh, Baptist Hospital now from what that hospital was. This, somebody asked me about this one right here. That was sitting where the Caterjohn building is now. Uh, that was Illinois Central uh, Hospital, or what everybody called the Illinois Central. It was originally built as a Chesapeake. Uh, I'm looking for. Okay, there you go. I knew I knew it had a railroad man in here somewhere. It was built. It burnt, and then they they uh, built the the one that's called the Caterjohn Building now. Um, I'm sorry. Well, Lourdes Hospital has got a second floor in wing on the north side, but uh, as far as just a building by itself, I don't recall that. There's one in uh, Hopkinsville, but that's probably about the closest. Were any of you in that class? <laughs> if that if that's not a bright looking bunch, and look how look how much they're smiling about having their picture made there. Well, it it could have been could have been a cold day. Uh, Saint Mary's Academy was was established in uh, 1858 before the Civil War and had 60 students whenever they uh, they started teaching the kids, uh, they were given their final exams when they finished a year by Judge Noble and Judge Gregory. So, I mean, I like to never got out. I can't imagine what it had been like been tested by a couple of uh, judges and what they would have had up there. Okay, y'all hang on. I'm going to mess it. There we go. This was a first grade group. Now there's, as best I could count, there's 40 heads popped up in there of kids. One teacher. And she looks a little worn up there, but she's probably got reason to you. 
that that uh, that lady had quite a crowd there, and of course we got the uh, the youngster sitting there with his hat on his head, waiting. To, I guess they made him take it off when he came outside. That was made on the steps of Jefferson School. Anybody know where that's at? Where it was at, rather. Where? You're very close. Eighth and Harrison. Yeah. Um, Lincoln. Lincoln on the upper left corner was uh, as it appeared whenever it was built um, about 1894 for Paducah's uh, black uh, population and then as it appeared right before it was uh, integrated or it wasn't integrated but in 64 and 65 Dr. E.W. Whiteside who was a very well known uh, educator, uh, very well liked man, uh, had the last graduating class up there and then uh, everybody went over to Tillman. Any questions about there? Don't ask me much about that one though. Here we go. Franklin School. Any of you in here go to Franklin? Okay. I have got a preacher friend that I trade Paducah stuff with. That, and being a preacher, he, I don't figure he can lie to me. He went to school there. He claimed that was absolutely the best school in the city of Paducah. He also claimed that they had the best athletic department of any school in Paducah. It'd be hard to look up the records to find out, so I, I've always just taken his word. He also said they had the meanest, hard-headedest boys there that any place in Paducah. And he claimed that kids from other schools were afraid to ride their bicycle down the street in front of that place. Now, he might have he been pulling my leg just a little bit on that, but anyhow, that's what he claimed. 13, 1350, where was it? 1350 uh, South 6th Street. It's, there's, some, there's another school uh, right out there next to the hollow. There's, a, there's another building out there that, that the Board of Education is using now. You, yeah. Not that one. Yeah. <laughs> but inside that, they have a plaque about Franklin School being there. Did say anything about them having the most hard headed boys in the city of Paducah? <laughs> All right. Well, folks, we had a teacher who taught in the school that was there after that one was torn down. After those hard headed boys tore that one down. How many of you recognize this one? Huh? That, and in a, probably in another year, you won't be able to recognize the ground that it was sitting on. That's Arcadia. It was sitting on what was then the Lone Oak, I mean, the Lovelessville Road, and what's now called the Lone Oak Road. Uh, that was where in 1937, whenever you got off of the 300 foot dock down there at 28th and uh, Broadway, you went up to Arcadia School and you were checked in and checked out as to where you were going, how many was in your family and all that kind of thing. Now, where that school's sitting right now, there's a huge building going up behind the one that's there. And I called the one that was there, I think during my last meeting, Brazelton Junior High, and I, and I got I got corrected it was Paducah Junior High or something that, so not being actually in the Paducah school system, I kind of missed out on that. And when you go to Lone Oak all the time, it's just hard to pick up on these others. Yeah. 
Washington. Any of you go to Washington? All right. Tell me, my mother claims that she used to have to take a fire escape down the outside of that building, and it was one of those that spin you around, and by the time you got to the bottom, everybody was sick. Okay, doesn't remember that. Washington School was sitting at 13th and Broadway. Now, 13th Street at that time, or at least when it was built, didn't go all the way through. Uh, you had a kind of a dirt path right there. And uh, Dick Fairhurst, Paducah Laundry, was sitting right across uh, Broadway on the other side of the street from where that location was at. And then down here in this uh, newspaper clipping, you can see that they're out there taking the, the metal sheathing off of the roof of that, uh, which I thought looks like would be one of them jobs that uh, would uh, would send almost anybody to the to the hospital. Uh, anytime you got that many schools going, you've got to have a library. So in the upper left-hand corner is a library that I grew up with and I was familiar with. Uh, it, uh, it, had, it had character. And it had one of the meanest librarians that was on the face of the earth, man. You didn't walk in there and talk, I'm telling you. And, you know, my wife lived uh, up on 23rd Street when she was going to school at Tillman. And the librarian would not allow the women to wear pants. So in the wintertime, uh, she'd have to walk from 23rd Street down here to the library wearing a dress. You librarians are a pretty mean bunch. You know that, don't you? <laughs> and then there was a small fire in the Carnegie Library in the 60s. Nobody could make up their mind what they wanted to do, go new, just like they did on the City Hall, or go in there and repair it, enlarge it, and that kind of thing. So you see, we got the Paducah Area Public Library, which is a very nice library. It's got lots of things to be thankful for. Uh, and that, of course, it has enlarged somewhat since that shot was made. If you lived in, um, well, if you lived anywhere, but if you lived in Paducah, back during the 1920s not, and before and after, you had one thing that you heated your house with, coal. Some people used wood, but coal was usually easier to get. You picked up the phone or you sent your kid down to the coal yard and told him to bring back a bucket of coal or you called and order a truck of, of coal. There you can see that was at 10th and Jefferson. Uh, most of the remains of, of that place are gone. Uh, I went over there several years ago, scrounging around until I was told to leave. There was nothing else there. Um, but that was the hand-colored postcard. I love those things. They are absolutely gorgeous. And St. Bernard, you used to see in old high school annuals, yearbooks, all kind of advertising in the back. And it was all black and white because color was really expensive at the time. And St. Bernard had this big dog, but they had a great big red S in there with it. You couldn't hardly miss it. I mean, it was an eye catcher. You were going to see it. How many of you have ever had an ice cream soda at Wilson's? No kidding? Man. You older than I thought you were. Okay, one, 
One shot up there shows us the building that most of us recognize as being Wilson's bookstore. Well, Jay, did you do that? I'll go on and talk about Wilson's anyhow. Wilson's uh, uh, ice cream soda fountain was really popular. I, I've heard all sorts of people my mother's age talk about going in there after a ball game or after school and getting ice cream. And um, they eventually got to where school supplies uh, were more of their business and they went to the school supply business instead of ice cream. You used to be able to buy a whole box of report cards for a dime. Uh, I suppose that meant that the school could buy them for a dime. I think that would have been a good business for a kid to be in, though. You could always <laughs> buy you one and make it up and take it home. Guthrie's Department Store. All right, have any of you ever bought anything at Guthrie's? Huh. Are you? Did you? That was at 322 Broadway. Were they a pretty good outfit to deal with? Were they a pretty good outfit to deal with? Okay. Guthrie's was one of the, uh, there was about four or five big name uh, families that had department stores. So if you wanted to be in person, you went to Guthrie's and, and got, you, uh, got you a suit of clothes. I'm sorry. It's not the no. No. There's another one. Rudy Phillips. Did anybody get a chance to go to Rudy's? What about Jack? No? Huh. Your mother did? Rudy's was a, a unique store. Now, before... In, before this was a going thing, Rudy's would black out all of the w store windows on the front of that store, all the way around in the back of the store too, where when you went in to buy something, you couldn't tell what was in there. And then they would have designers come down from New York and design the windows for Christmas. So the unveiling of Rudy's at Christmas was a big deal. And uh, it was one of those things that nobody wanted to miss. I've got some, I've got some pictures of people standing out in the street looking at it like something. Ma well, something magic did appear. They had all kind of stuff in there. And Rudy's was. I'm sorry. What? That's pro that, Yes. To that question. Mr. Rudy came to Paducah from Union County. He came down here in 1882, and he went into business with a man by the name of, name of Leach, who was in business on Second Street. So you had Leach and Rudy dry goods stores. Mr. Leach lasted about another year, and I guess he was getting ready to retire whenever uh, Mr. Rudy showed up. So he went on and retired. And another man went into partnership with Mr. Rudy by the name of Ellis. So then you had Ellis and Rudy. Move forward a couple of more years and you added a Mr. Phillips. And that lasted until about 1896. And in 1896, um, Mr. Ellis retired. They also moved over on Broadway, which is where that building was located at 219 Broadway. Mr. Rudy was also president of the first, uh, let me get this right now, of the Savings, Citizen Savings Bank, which actually was largely a kind of a prestige thing because there was all sorts of other people over there on the board that took care of actually running the bank, but Mr. Rudy was a, a 
I was a uh, very well-known businessman, so they put him in there as the president. He uh, he died in August seventh, nineteen nineteen. So he had a pretty good run in the clothing business in Paducah. And Rudy's advertising had a bunch of it. Whenever he sold somebody something and they went home, they would have something similar to this. Now, back then, you didn't find calendars sent out free to get you to look at them, but you found merchants that would send them home with you because any time you needed something, they wanted you to be able to look at something that was handy and find out where you needed to buy it. So this was some of Rudy's advertising here. And those two characters right there showed up on a lot of Rudy's advertising and on a lot of Paducah postcards telling about how great the climate was here. Uh, that's, that, that also is a stretch. <laughs> Wallerstein's. Jack, do you buy anything at Wallerstein's? Okay. Uh, that was founded by Herbert and Jacob Wallerstein, who came to Paducah in 1868, but they didn't come into Paducah and go right to that building. They went down to the Richmond House and put their shop inside the Richmond House. And by 1888, they had managed to do enough business that they had this landmark biz building built and were doing business in there. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm afraid to let that go out of my right hand. You know what that is? If you walked into the Wallerstein store and uh, there was door pushes and pulls on both of those doors. They were all four just like this, and unlike most of the door pushes pulls that were mounted in a vertical position, these were mounted horizontal. And uh, being a collector, I just come up with four of these. Of course, there was only four of them to come up with, but that's, that's where they were. I did have that one polished, but one of the bad parts about having a something that's brass is that you got to polish on it constantly. Okay, M. Livingston and Company, another businessman of note of Paducah, and Mr. Livingston would send out those cards to his to his grocers. He was a wholesale grocer. And he supplied a lot of the grocers in Paducah. Years ago, people didn't have enough money to, to have their own car, buggy, horse, things like that, and they'd walk everywhere. So neighborhood groceries were all over the place. And Mr. Livingston was after their business, so he'd give them a, a card like this to hand each one of their customers that bought their coffee. And whenever they got 10 of those, like, just cards like that. They could take them back in and turn them in for any one of that cookware. Um, he also, I've got one of his old catalogs up here. Um, he put out a Gold Bloom coffee, which is amazing because Gold Bloom showed up as a label on almost everything in the city of Paducah at one time or another. Huh? Yep, and being a collector, Mr. Livingston put those out to his stores so they could cut tobacco plugs with them. You stick it, you stick that tobacco plug in there, and on this side there are marks, and they'd say, "Give me one mark, two mark, whatever," and on that would come. That's a unique. Uh, cutter right there because it's got Livingston's on one side and then it's got the grocer's name in Knoxville, Tennessee on the other side. Most of them just wound up with the Livingston name on them. Uh, and you could get that out of Livingston's catalog 
when you were a grocer back then and completely nickel plated design for two dollars so I wish no I don't want to be that old I just wish I had one And there is a place that you see at not its best time. The home laundry. Y'all know where that's at? If you look at that building, the design of it is still almost the same as it is today. On the right hand side of it, you had a lower building and you could pull off of the street and pull right up and they'd have a uh, an attendant come out, get your laundry, and take it back in. It's at Tenth and uh, Tenth and Broadway. Yeah, Kentucky. I'm sorry, you're right. Tenth and Kentucky. Um, and the building is still there. I don't remember whether the lettering and stuff is still on the top of that, that or not. Uh, Mom always made me use a one of them scrub pants when I, she made me wash the dishes and clothes and everything else. <laughs> Woman's Club in 1931, if you were going to do something for a dance or a ball, you could go to the Woman's Club and I'll try this one more time. And you notice they've got a large ballroom. <laughs> I didn't Well, I thought I was. That's bad because that's the last one right there. Jay, how do I back this thing up? That wasn't it. Y'all knew when this was going to be free, you weren't going to get a whole lot. <laughs> Yeah. Is that where he worked out of all the time? The M. Livingston Company? All the or time. Have the else? No, I think, I, I think that is the only one. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Still don't trust you. Okay. That was the Woman's Club. How many of you ever went to the Woman's Club for a dance? Hmm, nobody. That that uh, that place was um, sitting at 614 Kentucky Avenue, and it burned down. Uh, that's when the women's club, I assume, moved over on to, to uh, Jefferson. Yeah. Uh, I'll try to go the right way this time. House of the Three Links. It was also on Kentucky Avenue. That was the Odd Fellows Lodge. However, they also had enough room in there that on the nights they weren't having lodge meetings, they would rent out the rooms to different uh, to different fraternal organizations. That was sitting on Fifth Street. I mean, on Kentucky Avenue between Fifth and Sixth before it burned down. Uh, I guess there used, must have used to been a lot of fire problems in Paducah. Now. There is an awful nice looking building. It's without the porch though. One of the things that uh, most people think that there was a porch on that building all the time. And uh, they put a porch on it and one of the things I love about that place is that as you walk into the doors up here, it's got a great big elk's head with huge antlers in a mosaic in the floor looks really great. I might have to speed up because that guy back there is getting ready to get. Any questions on that one? Okay, top left up there, you see the home of John Fisher, still sitting where it was then, at Ninth and Bro uh, Ninth and Jefferson. Now he also built a house next door 
to it that mirrors that floor plan with the exception of the turret and his daughter got that when she got married down here you see Ben Wiley's house which is no longer there and it was uh, sitting at 733 Jefferson Street okay here is the automobile lane and this is where tired tourists parked whenever they showed up at Hook's Tourist Park. Um, Hook's Pavilion, the home of good dancing. <laughs> they also had an athletic field. And that was home to Paducah uh, Kitty League Baseball. And some of the good ball players back then were making 40 and $50 a month playing baseball. There was uh, three of them that made it to the major leagues. And I know that probably some of you baseball people in here could tell me who they, they were. But they had a, this, this thing was, uh, R.L. Meyer was the president and um, Ben Tencup was the manager. They had uh, a food allowance. Gene Thompson, who was one of the players on the Kitty League, became a starting pitcher with the Cardinals. And um, I'll stumble all over this word, but Andy Bergenano, I hope none of y'all are related to him the way I pronounced that, was one of the outfielders who also managed to go play professional ball. He went and played for Cincinnati team Where was that it was on North 8th Street the exact location on North 8th Street I don't know it was on part of Highway 45 route is on North 8th right. and they built that but uh, to keep it on 45 so it was on uh, it would have been up someplace from park over toward the, the uh, probably toward the A Street Bridge or the A Street uh, Ferry. Barger and Golightly uh, built an awful big place. Uh, they were also uh, wholesalers like uh, Mr. Livingston was. And I can't tell you who is who, but one of those is Mr. Barger and the other one is Mr. Right facing out that way or right? My right. My right. Oh, okay. Were you and him about the same age? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Baduca Iron Company. What I find strange about these postcards is the location. You see the location on that uh, Paducah Iron Company at 124-126 South 3rd Street, and this was about 1908. So today you assume whenever you got some, something that's a, an iron company, they've got to have lots of places to put lots of iron. Uh, so I assume they had the back of a building or something or uh, opened up where you could go through it and pick up piping, um, angle iron, whatever you needed. And then the Dixie Shirt Works. Did you ever get a shirt from there? Okay. Dixie Shirt Works was on Broadway. It was up on um, 630, 632, and 634. They made uh, shirts, pants, and overalls. And that was circa 1899. People always wanted you to have advertising close by. One on the left up there is Fowler Wolf Sheet Metal Works. Back in those days at that back in those days they had to have a lot of sheet metal because they used that on roofs, uh, guttering, downspouts, and breachings. Jack, what's a breaching? Uh, okay, I'll try to 
Yeah, it says it made stacks and tanks. Other one over there is R.G. Terrell, and actually R.G. Terrell is just a little bit older than that. Um, he was a leader in all sorts of seeds and farming goods. He handled uh, Tennessee wagons. He handled Knoxville wagons. Um, and he was at uh, 119 and 121 South 7th in 1896, as you can see on that calendar. So they always wanted to have calendars for their customers so they could nail them on the kitchen wall whenever you needed to know when you, need, when you were going to order something. Right there was a calendar close by. An old porch swing, a moonlight night, and you, dear. Ernest A. Rourke um, was the copywriter and publisher of the sheet music. And, you know, I've got a, as a collector, I, I just collect all sorts of stuff. I got a bunch of sheet music that's from Paducah. A lot of it was, was put out by the Wallersteins. However, this is interesting because it's the first time I'd ever seen that one up there. Goodyear. Jack, do you ever buy Goodyear tires there? Okay. That building right there was sitting. Now, let's go along with me here. You people have been in Paducah for a while. What's that building right there? The what? Theater. Columbia Theater. Uh-uh. They didn't contend yet. They didn't Broadway. Uh-uh. All right. What's that building right there? Citizens Bank. That's Citizens Bank. That's Ruby Drive. The one on the left. That is a 10-story building, the bank. That, that is Rose Buford. Rose Burford. Yeah, that was where that building was located. That is on 6th and Jefferson. Uh, is that the Cobb Hotel that we're talking about? No, right up there. <laughs> no, that was that was the the uh, ten story building, the bank building, and then you know you used to have uh, thank you, you used to have the the uh, Rose Burford's main showroom sitting right next to it, and then they'd have their warehouse over on Jefferson Street. Uh, Three, uh, folks, that guy in the back is waving stuff all over the place telling me I have talked way too long. <laughs>